Hi, this is Gabe Ignetti. And I am the Progressive Eco-Modernist. If you want to find out more about eco-modernism, just go to ecomodernism.org. With us today, we have Lee Phillips. Lee Phillips is a science writer and European affairs journalist. He has written for Nature, The New Scientist, The Guardian, The Daily Telegraph, The New Statesman, Jacobin, and The Scientific American, among many other publications. He's also the author of two books, The People's Republic of Walmart and Austerity, Ecology, and the Collapse Porn Addicts, A Defense of Growth, Industry, and Stuff. Hi, Lee. Welcome to the show. Hi, Gabe. So we're here talking about Michael Moore and his movie. And you did a nice article in the Jacobin about that. Give us a little synopsis. Planet of the Human is a film by Jeff Gibbs, who has been an environmentalist all of his life. Then a number of years ago, he began to realize that there were a lot of problems, that the environmental movement has been telling us a bunch of lies over the years. Renewable energy is not going to save the planet. And that the only solution, therefore, is to radically reduce the number of humans on the planet and to have a cap on economic growth. And so basically, it's a sort of Malthusian argument for the modern day. He did an article in the Jacobin called Age of Anti-Humans. So talk to us a little bit about that. So the article I wrote for Jacobin Magazine was Planet of the Anti-Humanists. And basically, I sort of recapitulated a lot of the arguments that I've been making for a number of years, not just in my first book, Austerity, Ecology, and the Collapse of Porn Addicts, but in a number of other articles that I've written. There's just a lot of out-of-date information put out in the film with respect to renewable energies and their efficiencies. The footage that was initially shot was from maybe 2008, 2009. There's just some out-of-date stuff. When Gibbs and Moore say that the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow, the gaps have to be filled with fossil fuels, they're sort of not wrong there. And that is something that a lot of the so 100% renewable advocates who have criticized the film sort of leap over and don't really want to talk about. And this is where some people in sort of the pro-nuclear community, and I consider myself part of that, have said, look, you know, this is a good film, that it's actually confronting one of the real problems with 100% renewables only approach to the clean transition. And the film doesn't really go into any discussion of the nuclear, it just sort of leaves it out. If you've watched any of the follow-up videos that Gibbs and Moore have done, they do talk about nuclear and, and they're very much opposed to nuclear as well. They have given up on any sort of possible transformation. Moore mentions that one of his very first acts as a political activist, as a progressive, was to campaign against nuclear power in the early 1970s, which is interesting because, you know, at that time, the burgeoning environmental movement didn't really have a full conception of climate change or the impacts of greenhouse gases. And or a lot of them argued at the time that we should get off nuclear power and go to coal, use coal instead, which is crazy because coal wasn't actual and good and really? uh, nuclear. Oh my yeah. God, I, I never knew that. I keep hearing this trope, and I know you're familiar with it too, is that technology is not the solution. Right, yeah. I think that's really what these guys are trying to say. I hear it all the time. It's an article of faith. Here's my take, and I want to, it's a little different from yours. What Michael Moore is saying is not untrue. It's just his focus is wrong. Because it seems to me that we do have a problem with consumption because of waste streams. And that the more population grows, the more problems we have. We do have to grow, and we can't be culling back populations or anything or telling people how many kids they're going to have. But these are, within reason, these are worthy goals. It's good to have the old shoemaker. It's good to have the repairman rather than have a throwaway society. That's what I'm talking about. They're right, but it's not what should be focused on. It certainly is irrational to use more 
of a substance, uh, materials or energy, then we need to deliver a particular good or service. I am a big supporter of uh, right to repair, regulation to eliminate planned obsolescence. All of these things are irrational excess use of material and energetic inputs. So the, the problem with the excess there is that we could be using them for something else. The problem does not result from endless growth in consumption. Um, this is not what causes environmental problems. Perhaps the most classical example to show why this is not the case is the ozone layer problem. I grew up in the 1980s and I can remember this, telling my mom that she should stop using hairspray. And of course, it wasn't just a hairspray, it was chlorofluorocarbons. The idea that everybody talked about was we've got to start using hairspray in fridges. We've got to stop the growth in that. Well, what we did instead was that we regulated the market. Governments enforced technological change to switch away from CFCs to other chemicals. As a result of that, by about mid-century, the ozone layer should be completely healed. So as a progressive, as a socialist, what I'm saying is growth is not what caused this. It was the market left to its own devices. And we haven't stopped having any fridges and hairspray. In fact, there are more fridges and hairspray than ever before. There's about a dozen or so different other very significant environmental challenges that we have faced from lead poisoning to air pollution, water pollution, certainly in the West. It is the case that climate change and greenhouse gases is a much larger problem. These were much easier to regulate. And the way that we do that at the end of the day is technology switching, infrastructure build out, funding of research and development. There may be some role for some market-based mechanisms, but overwhelmingly, even those are still interventions within the market by government to enforce this transition. I'm, what I'm saying is that by focusing on growth, uh, whether we're talking about population growth or growth in material use or growth in the economy and GDP, you're missing the boat entirely. What we should be talking about is the problem of the market left to its own devices. And so long as we're talking about growth over here, we're missing the real villain in the room. So it's just a classical socialist, progressive, even Rockefeller Republican argument about the importance of the role of government, of regulation, of trade unions against the market left to its own devices. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's good to consume what you want. It's good buy the big screen TV or whatever. I'm not against that. But when the advertising industry creates needs and creates anxieties for people to buy more and more stuff that they don't need or to buy the 50th pair of shoe or whatever, that's a thing, too, when we talk about consumerism. Right. You hear that a lot from people like Naomi Klein that's been around since the 1950s. The story is a lot more complicated. The gains from the growth in productivity in the last 40 years has overwhelmingly gone to the wealthy, to the owners of production, not to the workers. The standard of living of a lot of working people has actually either stagnated or declined in many areas. Yeah. The struggles over people able to feed their families as a result of the, the lockdowns and the lack of government supports for them. While there is some seductions on the part of advertising, and I'm certainly not saying that the, all production is rational, what I am saying is when people say that we all are consuming too much, when most people are just struggling to get by, I'm wondering who exactly is this we? I got you there. But let me say this, though. There's this pressure even for consumers, even, even at the cost of needs. Well, sometimes it's, it's very much a roller coaster of the money that I bring in every month. And, you know, there's certainly times where, like, well, I'm not doing so well this month. Do I really need to go and have a beer? <laughs> I do anyway. And let me put it another way. There's a great essay by George Orwell. I can't remember the name of the essay, but he's talking about how there's a certain kind of middle class pro uh, progressive, a sort of middle class socialist argument where there's a sort of, they're doing very well and they're looking at the people beneath them and wondering why are they putting sugar on their bread? They don't need to spend on sugar or tobacco. That's outrageous. Every once in a while, we need a little bit of, of joy in our lives. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. The environmental movement has gone ballistic. I mean, the leadership 
yeah. it's really gone ballistic with Michael Moore. And there's a dilemma here, because I know I have always been involved with environmentalism, mm -hmm. and I just fight mm -hmm. them internally as best I can, you know, support nuclear power, because you can't do it without nuclear power. So, I mean, yeah. there's this contradiction that they're caught up with. They are on a path to failure. Yeah. Can this be turned around? Uh, do you have any insights about how it can be better be done? Should we be involved in environmentalism? Should we just have our own thing go on and, and separate ourselves? How, how do we deal with this dilemma? How do we circle that square? Well, I'm pretty optimistic. The last five to 10 years where progressives who have a much more evidence-based approach with respect to nuclear, with respect to genetic engineering, with respect to carbon capture and storage, uh, just whatever it happens to be led by the evidence. I mean, sometimes we describe this community as eco-modernist. I've just always considered myself to be a, a lefty science writer that demands evidence and rationality. So I will change my mind on a dime in the face of, of new evidence. And, and generally, eco-modernists tend to be free markets, whereas I am not. Some of my best friends are eco-modernists. Uh, 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 no, I mean, it's very wide open. You could be anywhere from an anarchist to a communist. Yeah. I think that the last five to 10 years of activism, to be honest, and presentation of evidence and argumentation, reports produced, articles produced, podcasts and so on, that we've been doing for over this period has really, I think, turned the tide. I think that more and more, particularly young people who did not grow up during the Cold War and don't have that sort of conflation in their head of nuclear weapons equals nuclear power, they're much more able to have a rational evidence-based conversation about nuclear power. Jacobin Magazine is probably the premier left-wing uh, magazine in the United States, and it regularly produces articles that are pro-nuclear. We've had two articles that are pro-nuclear in the, in the past. Yeah, Dissent as well, and Mother Jones also. Yeah, absolutely. In Finland in particular, Australia, um, there's a lot of advances. Uh, we just saw AOC in New York, the standard bearer of the, of the democratic socialist left in the United States, has come out in favor of nuclear power, or at least saying that the door is open to nuclear power, which is great. The time is turning. I don't think that Greta is really that much against nuclear power, even with her reservations, because she admits that it's necessary. Really? She accepts the findings of the IPCC, but she believes it's dangerous and ecologically destructive. I think I have a lot of problems with Greta Thunberg because of her sort of degrowth perspective, yes. her anti-aviation perspective and anti-nuclear anti perspective, instead of looking for the sort of solutions that, uh, that we've been talking about. Well, she's a 16-year-old kid. Exactly. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I would say, uh, even though I have issues with some of the stances she's taken, well done to Greta for being so young and uh, getting involved in politics and the struggle to combat climate change yeah. at such a young age and having such a, a profound leadership uh, skill there. I think yeah. well done, absolutely. Yeah. So my criticisms are more that I would I would hope to convince her rather than yeah. to denounce her. Yeah. If Greta Thunberg could come out in favor of nuclear power and in favor of synthetic hydrocarbons to clean up aviation long haul shipping instead of saying we have need to give up aviation, I think that would be a game changer. Which is such a tribune. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I, I think she's very intelligent. I think it's just Yeah, absolutely doesn't have enough life experience to really grasp all of this. I believe some really crazy things when I was 16 years old. Forget it, man. I was just in a park playing basketball when I was 16. <laughs> I mean, geez, I, was I wasn't even thinking half of the stuff that she was thinking. I mean, so. Yeah, yeah. The question that I'm looking more precisely is just, how is the best way for us to be right turning the situation in our favor. Yes. This is a dilemma. I am with 350, even right. though, you know, I disagree with them. A lot of the membership, they will not argue with me about this. Some will, some like, you know, they just freak out and I've had right. problems. Yes. But 
most of them aren't. I'm right in the leadership space with it and everything, but it's like total confirmation bias. I mean, just total yeah, denial. Yeah. And the thing is, is that the leadership tends to be the most fanatical, dedicated people. And, right. and they yeah. tend to be the most closed-minded. And I think that a big problem here is these organizations are not democratic. You know, they just yeah. dictate to the, the membership. In general, I don't necessarily always think that NGOs are the best sort of mechanism or pathway to achieving change. Although sometimes, you know, I recognize that they, they have a role to play, but they do begin to be sometimes self-licking ice cream cones. They exist to exist. Yeah. And so they will make decisions on the basis of what campaigns they should do or how they should package the campaigns led by their communications team rather than scientific advisors. Yes, it's all opportunist. It's, yeah, absolutely, because they need to get funding from their donors, their large donors and their small scale donors. They don't want to offend their base. That's exactly right. And we've heard this from, uh, from Bill McKibben, who I think in many respects is a real hero in terms of raising awareness around climate change. He's admitted a few years ago that, yeah, basically we you know, probably do need nuclear, but I can't come out to, to say that because that would split the movement. I have enormous admiration for Bill McKibben, but I think there's a certain cowardice there on his part. If he is so willing to speak truth to power to fossil fuel companies, he needs to be brave enough to speak truth to the power to his own supporters and donors. If for him to come out and say that would be just fantastic. But I, you know what? I think they're on, some of these people are on the cusp of doing it because of the work that people like us have done over the last 10 years. Uh, so I've heard some rumors that Friends of the Earth in England and Wales is considering coming. Like This is like background information. So I don't know who's winning and who's losing this, but I think that the, but my understanding is that there are some people who want the organization to come out in favor of nuclear within the NRDC as well. There's a couple of major ones that have already made that switch. I think the Environmental Defense Fund is pro-nuclear now. So this is pretty good. Wow. We just need to keep pushing. Because if yeah. it's a climate emergency, then act like it's a climate emergency. Don't say, oh, we can't. All hands on deck. Oh, and by the way, we cannot have a carbon fee and dividend. Where the evidence uh, base suggests that there should be criticisms. I have gone back and forth uh, maybe five times on my opinions about biofuels. Now, of course, you have to depend on what type of biofuels we're talking about here. We need to change our minds and face new evidence and open to criticism where the evidence base suggests. So and we need to be flexible. Yeah. We need to be flexible. Absolutely need to be flexible. Yeah. Lee, sure. thank you very much for being on our show. Okay. Thank you. Uh, no, it's, it's great, to, great to be on here. We want to thank our audience and take care, and we'll be seeing you till next time. Mm -hmm.